Amen. Have a seat. I am pumped and excited about this morning. For one, going into one of my most favorite psalms of all times. We're in the middle of this series, seeing Jesus in the psalms. And I think there are times when we, we jump into the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we don't have a clear understanding and vision that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus existed in the times of the Old Testament. Sometimes I think we believe in our hearts and our minds that Jesus just appeared for some reason in the New Testament. But he has always been for all of eternity, and we want to see where Jesus comes alive in these Psalms. And so we have a couple of things that we're going to look at today, but for this entire series, I want us to have a couple of things at the core of our hearts. First one is that throughout all of the Psalms, I want us to see the finished work of Jesus throughout all of time and all of Scripture. Then the second thing I want us to see is how Jesus delights in blessing his children. I think sometimes for some reason as Christians, we don't uh, understand or realize that God is spoken of in Scripture as a father who enjoys and delights in his children. He delights in blessing his children. And sometimes life can be really hard and really difficult, and we're not experiencing the blessing of the Lord, and we can forget that God actually delights in blessing us, in bringing us blessing. Then the third thing is that we want to learn how to delight in Jesus and in his word. And so in the Psalms, as we're going through them, I want us to see a vision for that, for when we go home, throughout our weeks, throughout our days, that we can open up at any time, at any place, in any season, and read these as prayers back to God, and worship throughout all of the Psalms with these songs and these prayers and these poems. And then last, I want us to learn how to pray with humility and vulnerability as we're journeying through this series. So this morning, in Psalm 63, we're going to be talking about longing. Longing. And we're not just talking about this because I've been alone with four kids under seven for the past four days. My wife took a trip, um, and uh, she's been uh, just taking somewhat of a rest with her mom and her sister up at a lake house in Maryland. And so uh, it's not this longing. We're not speaking about this because I'm longing, right? Uh, the first night, I'm not going to lie, I found myself sitting on my couch trying to prepare for this sermon. And uh, I ended up watching a YouTube video of Aerosmith's uh, Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Right? You remember that song? <laughs> Even when I dream of you. Right? That guy? That, that whole, like, that's what I found myself doing. Um, and I don't really know if I'm longing for my wife to come back or just not to deal with my four kids alone. Um, but I think it's a mixture of both of those things. But that's, but longing, that deep desire that we have. The things that we treasure most. That's what longing is. It's something really deep inside. It's not this just kind of half-hearted, um, you know, desire that's kind of, you know, like I kind of want uh, some ice cream or I kind of want some coffee or I'm in the mood for a club sandwich for lunch. No, no, it's this deep longing, something that you search for, something that you desire with all of your being. And so in Psalm 63, we're opening up and we're entering into King David. Now, I want us to, to understand the context of we're walking into this psalm. We've got a king. This is the same David that defeated the Goliath, right? So if we're getting our context right with who this person is, this is the guy who, when he was a teenager, saw this huge giant, and everybody scared, the whole Israel army scared of this giant. He walks out there with a rock and a sling and goes, my God is bigger than you, and flings this thing and hits the giant and slays the giant, right? And he becomes this war hero. That's who this David is. And so we're coming in to 2 Samuel. This is the, 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 the context of this passage. This is where I believe we are entering into. And in 2 Samuel, we have King David running out in the wilderness from his son, Absalom. So we have to understand where David's heart is in this before we, we read this. And so there's going to be a chart that's going to come up on the screen. I want us to understand the family context here. So we've got King David, the man. The guy who God said was a man after his own heart. The man who God has blessed beyond all blessings. Who Jesus was going to come out of his lineage. That David, he has a wife, an Israelite, and has a son, an Amnon. Now, Amnon would be the oldest son and would be the heir to the throne. Then he also has another wife. That was legal back then and, and during those times, right? So don't get any ideas. But um, King David 
and he has uh, two children with the daughter of the king of Geshur. And the daughter's name of them is Tamar, and she is beautiful. And then he also has a son, Absalom. Both of these would be foreigners, not heirs to the throne. But one of the things that we see in 2 Samuel is that Amnon falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar, because she is beautiful. And so what he does is he lures her in to his, his room, and he acts like he's six, and he asks for her to take care of him. And then he rapes her. And this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to a woman ever. And he takes advantage of her, and he uh, desecrates her, and then his anger burns against his sister in such, in such a way where he casts her out of his home, which again is a huge no-no. Right now, she has not only been desecrated, but now she, in that culture, would have not been worthy of finding a husband now. So now she's alone, broken, raped, taken advantage of, and set aside. So guess what? Absalom, he's angry. Right? And he wants King David to go after him and do something. But now, Amnon is the heir to the throne. And David wrestles with this and doesn't do anything about it. And so now two years goes by. And so Absalom, now here's what we know about Absalom. He is known as this charming, good-looking, very peaceful man. He's one that people like, he's the guy that like you would uh, walk into a place or room, everybody would want to know who he is, and he's just someone that draws you into him. They, the words that are used in scripture is kind of this idea of charming. Someone's like, man, I just want to be around this person. You ever know someone like that? Well, that's who Absalom is. And so, so he is like that. So what he does is he throws this party. He has all the children of David and the kings and the princes and the, all these, that come together. And he has his men kill Amnon. And so now all of a sudden you have this thing going on between all these family members and all this stuff. And then Absalom decides, you know what? David's not worthy to keep the throne. And so he causes a revolt. And so he gets everybody in the kingdom to come onto his side, and he chases King David, the beloved of the Lord, out into the wilderness. And the reason why I think Psalm 63 is talking about that, because we see in verse 11, where he says, but the king shall rejoice. So the other time that David's on the run is when Saul was pursuing after him, but he wasn't king then. And so when he says here about himself, he says, no, 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 I was, I'm, I'm the king, and I'm on the run. So his son is chasing after him, trying to kill him so he could take over the kingdom. And that's the context in which we're entering into this psalm in Psalm 63, where David is now longing for something. But here's what I want us to see here. David isn't longing after changed circumstances. He is longing after an intimate relationship with his creator. See, there's a difference. See, I think for you and I, when circumstances change, it can cause us to long for changed circumstances. But for King David, he wasn't longing after a changed circumstance. He was longing after his creator, the one who he had an intimate, personal relationship with. And so I feel like the question that God was stirring in my own heart was, what is the deepest longing inside my soul? Inside of the core of my being, a lot uh, we see that most people would describe... Um, this uh, two-sided part of our being. One would be flesh, the other would be soul or spirit. Right? I think those words can be used interchangeably. So the deepest part of the depths of your soul, your emotions, your heart, is what is the deepest longing inside of your soul? What is the object of the greatest value and love that you have? I love what a, a 16th century theologian said, Henry Segal. He said, the worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. What is the object of your love this morning coming into here? See, here's the problem. For me, I'm just going to speak for me, maybe not you, but I tend to long for short-lived pleasures and worthless objects. So this is my problem. I tend for 99% of my life, to long for short-lived pleasures and worthless objects. So 
um, these short-lived pleasures, it's kind of this temporary satisfaction. It's like last night, wanting my wife to come home. I'm bored. I'm sitting there. I threw on a Netflix film because I've seen them all, right? And, uh, just, and then so I went and got a big thing of Talenti ice cream. It's gelato, um, and it's brand new, and it's in the garbage because I ate the whole thing. In one sitting, last night, I started measuring up the calories and the amounts of fat, and my stomach's still hurting because of it. It's not this temporary satisfaction. It's kind of like uh, imagining yourself uh, in a boat in the middle of the ocean for days and days and days and longing for water when you're surrounded by salt water. That's what these short-lived pleasures are. See, if you can imagine yourself being so thirsty that all you long for is water and you look around and there's water all around you, but you can't drink it, Because the moment that you take that water and you start to sip it, it may quench your thirst for a moment, but it will kill you. That's what all of these short-lived pleasures are in this world. Everything that has been created by God is a short-lived pleasure. That's why in Romans it says we begin to worship the creation rather than the creator. But that's what we do with our lives. We worship God the short-lived pleasures in this life. And then there are these worthless objects. Yesterday I had the bright idea of jumping on a golf cart and going around garage sailing with four little kids under seven. (laughs) Idiot, right? And so what did we do? We pulled up to every single garage sale, and guess what all of my girls did? Every single thing they saw they wanted. Oh, I want this, I want this, can I have this, that, that, right? Right? They picked up, no lie, about 10 items that they already had at home. And the ones that they had at home were in way better condition than the ones that they were picking up. And they wanted to pay $1 and $2 and $5 and $10 for people's garbage. Stuff that they already had. But that's, we, we, we tend to worship and long for these worship, right, to the point where they were crying hysterically. And we look at that and we say, that's just dumb. But I do it. I do it every day in my life where I am longing for these worthless objects, things that don't matter. Cars and homes and boats and RVs and just stuff that the Bible says moth and rust will one day destroy. I want you to think back to when you were a little kid and you really desired something for Christmas. What was that object? For me, it was a drum set. Never got it. But anyway, but think of that one thing that you got that you loved beyond all things. Where is it now? I, 99% of you don't have it. Probably in the garbage. Because all the stuff that we long for ends up there. So we tend to long after these worthless, worthless objects and these short-lived pleasures. So let's join David in the wilderness when the short-lived pleasures and the worthless objects of his kingdom has all faded away. He had all. He had everything you could ever imagine. Every worthless object and short-lived pleasure that you can ever desire, David had it. And it's all gone. It's all faded away. And so what is the deepest part of his soul longing for? Psalm 63. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 again. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I love that word earnestly. It means early in the morning, the first thing I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Does my soul long for a personal relationship with Jesus as its greatest treasure? This is where Jesus is talking to the crowd in Matthew 13. and He uses two analogies. And he says the first one is there's this treasure that is hidden in a field. And a man comes and stumbles upon it and finds this treasure. And what he does is he goes and he sells all that he has just to buy this field so that he may obtain that treasure. And then he says, it's like a man who finds this beautiful pearl. 
And he goes and he sells all that he has to buy this treasure. What is the thing that you are willing to give up all in order to obtain in your life? See, for David, we see when he was pressed at his worst. You know, um, when we're really squeezed in life, what comes out is what really is inside. Right? You squeeze an orange, what comes out? Not apple juice. Orange juice. Squeeze a tube of toothpaste, toothpaste comes out. In life, when we're really squeezed, what is the thing that we long for most? The thing that's inside of our soul the thing that we desire most. Longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure is not a to-do list. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with a person, someone who is real, someone who we interact with. We talk about intimacy with God, and I think men, if you look at me for a second, I think sometimes we can, we can get lost in that word intimacy. Because intimacy is not necessarily something that computes with a man's persona of how God has created us. But what that word intimacy means is interaction. Deep, intimate interaction. Where we get to, to speak and talk and engage with the creator of the universe. Our galaxy is one galaxy in the midst of billions of galaxies. We are a speck of dust on a speck of dust in a speck of dust. And the creator of all of that desires to know you personally, intimately, not just about you, not like me saying I know Ricky Medlock from Leonard Skinner, ah, I, know, I know that guy, but I can tell you the stats and I can tell you the songs and I can sing them for you. No, but it's actually knowing the person, getting to know who they are, what makes them tick, what gives them life, what they desire. And so that's what we're talking about here. This longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure is a relationship. And so as I was reading this, I actually don't tend to do this with like my outlines, but all these questions started popping up in my brain as I was reading these for myself. And so my hope this morning was that, that you can begin to process some of the things that God was working in on my own life and my own heart as I was going through this passage. And so the first question when I read this, verse 1, where David says, Oh God... You are my God. The question that I asked myself in that moment was, do I know Jesus in a way that I would call him my God? Not the God of my parents, right? I think as, as there's a lot, ton of teenagers, middle schoolers and high schoolers in this room, right? not the God of my parents, not the, the, the God of the church that I go to, the God of my pastors or the God of, of my school? Is he my God? Is it just something I do or believe in because I've been told to? Or have I actually engaged with God in such a way where I would call him my God, my ruler, my savior, my king, my Lord? Is this personal for me? And then the second question I was asking myself, comes from the next part. He says, earnestly I seek you. Like I said, that word means early in the morning. The first thing when you, you ever wake up and you're like, right? Something like, you know, one of the kids comes in. The other day I was laying in bed and, uh, and all of a sudden, like Everly was just hovering over me. And when Everly uh, wakes up in the morning, her hair is like this. She kind of looks like a lion. And so I was sleeping and all of a sudden I kind of just felt something. And so like, I opened up my eyes, and all of a sudden, there was this like, lion head next to me. And, like, and, I, and so I jumped and like, like, kind of pushed the covers over because I was so scared of what, would, what this thing was in my room. Um, it was my four-year-old daughter. And uh, so, but that's like the first thing in the morning when I wake up. Is Jesus the thing that I seek? You know what I think wages war against that? My busyness and my success. I talk to far too many people in this church and in this community that when you say, hey, how you doing? They say, oh, busy. You know what that usually means? I don't have time for God. Because if you followed up that question, which I rarely do, if you follow up that question with how you doing and they say busy with, yeah, when was the last time you spent time with Jesus? Chances are, answer would be seldom. Oh, not in a while. Our busyness and our success 
wages war against me earnestly seeking God as my greatest treasure. Then I kept reading, I kept going. And then he says this, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And the question that God started placing on my heart is, do I hunger and thirst for a relationship with Jesus? I think it's very easy for us to say, I have a relationship with Jesus, but then also say that we don't know how to have a relationship with Jesus. Two ways that we can have a relationship with Jesus. This is going to be profound, so you want to write this down. Ready? The Bible and prayer. I know that's new information, so I know you've got to process this. The Bible and prayer. Do you want to know Jesus more? Open this up. I've talked to far too many men in general that say, I just don't get it. Man, if we love something, we figure it out. I know men that can tear apart an entire engine and put it back together. That can build beautiful playhouses in their backyard or beautiful things in their home. Men that can, can compute how the synapses and plants can all of a sudden create these vegetables and fruit that we see. And they can compute all that, but no, I don't get the Bible. Have you spent time with it? Have you found somebody that does understand it, that you would be willing to sit under and learn from? That's what the Bible talks about, discipleship. I didn't learn this by, by just sitting down and reading it one day. I had many, many men of God and women of God pour into my heart and my life and my mind where I sat under their teaching and they opened this up with me and they processed this with me in a way that was intimate and real and they shared with me how this has impacted and changed their life. Do I hunger and thirst for a relationship with Jesus? If so, then we hunger and thirst for his word and to engage with him in prayer. Prayer is not easy. There is so many things that can distract us in this world. I mean, I would say, you know, go, go outside on a nice day. And go for a walk. You know, and then you start going for that walk, and then that one bee is just trickling and following after you. Right? Or that butterfly that, you know, pulls your attention. Or the people that are walking their dogs that are barking at you. Right? No matter where we go in this world, there's going to be distraction. There's going to be things that are trying to pull us. And in fact, I believe that the devil sometimes puts those things there that could be really good things, but to distract us from our prayers and distract us from our God. And so the noises, the music, very few times do I try to engage God in prayer in the midst of quietness. Usually I throw on Alexa or music and I play it in the back. And I just saw, but how often does that distract me from hearing the voice of my God? Am I willing to get up early, earnestly, and sit before God in the quiet of the darkness of the morning? Am I? Oh, if I do that, then I'm going to be tired for work. Really? Try it. Try it for a day, a week, a month. You know what my excuse was? Oh, I'll wake up my kids. If I wake up, my kids are going to wake up. All right. Try it. Get out of your bed, and the first thing you do is drop to your knees and sit beside your bed and pray to your God. Do I earnestly long and hunger and thirst for a relationship with Jesus? If so, I, there needs to be pursuit. Right? If I wanted to have a relationship with my wife, I can't not pursue her. Relationship requires pursuing. And the beauty of the gospel for us is that God is the ultimate pursuer. He has pursued each and every person in this room, whether you believe it or not. He has pursued you to have relationship with you. He has given his son's life so that he may have relationship with you. And he has restored all things just to know you. He cares. And he just wants some time to engage with you, for you to know him more you hunger and thirst for a relationship with Jesus. And then 
I started getting into verses 2 and 3. And this is where it really started weighing heavy on my heart. In verse 2 he says, So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding, I love that word, right? Beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Here's the question that God placed on my heart. Have I seen his power and glory in such a way that causes me not to fear death? I love my life. I love my girls. I love my wife. I love this church. I love that we get to come here every Sunday and enjoy relationship with one another and hang out throughout the week and engage with the word of God together. But have I seen his power and glory in such a way that causes me not to fear death? To to look at life like Paul and say, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do I long to see Jesus' face in such a way where the things of this world are just fleeting pleasures and worthless objects? Have I looked upon him in the sanctuary and held his power and glory and think that his love is better than life itself? David's out in the wilderness. David is longing for his creator and he's saying, you know what? My kingdom can be restored or it cannot be. The jackals can get me. We just watched Lion King. The hyenas are coming after me. And if I die, I get to be with my Savior, my Lord, my God. So Absalom, come take my life. It's all right. I get to be with my God. Looked upon you in the sanctuary, beheld your power and your glory, your love, your mercy, your grace. It is better than life itself. Then the last thing. This is a hard one, and this is a heavy one. But I want us to ask this question. Would the world around me say that Jesus is my greatest treasure? If I ask my little girls who see through all the fluff, Hey, what does daddy love most in this world? What would they say? They may say Jesus. They, you know, they answer all their questions. I'm the pastor's kids. What does, Jesus, what does daddy love most in this world? Jesus. Why do you think he loves Jesus? Well, because you're a pastor and you have to. Oh, I hope. I hope that the reason why I love Jesus is not because I'm a pastor. That's my profession. It's the thing that I do that I actually love Jesus in such a way that I can't wait for people to know who he is. If that's the reason why I love Jesus, just because I'm a pastor, then man, that is a sad day for all of us. The people that are closest to you in your life, when they look at your life, what would they say that you love most? Would they say it's your kids, your family, your home? All good things. Love those things well. Men, love those things well. Women, love those things well. But don't love it as your greatest and highest treasure. Because one day, those things will pass away. But the glory of the Lord will reign forever. So in verse 4, when he says, So I will bless you as long as I live. And in your name I will lift up my hands. I love what he's saying in verse 5. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Love. David is longing for here, which is to know God. And so if the answer is no for any of these questions, what do we do? Because I'm guessing that for most of us, there may be a no in the midst of these five questions. There's a lot of questions. And if the answer is no, you know what the Bible says to us? The Bible says repent. You know what that word repent means? It means to change your mind. Right? It's, all right, here's the, here's the physical idea of repenting. Ready? 
Stop focusing on what's in front of you. The thing that causes the no, turn around. (laughs) Repent. Change your mind. Say, this is worthless. This is worthy. This is short-lived. This is permanent. This is just fluff. This is real. Repent. So, so if you, for number one, would say, no, do I know Jesus in a way that would, I would call him my God, what would you call your God? If the answer is no for God being your God, then what would you call your God? And then lay it down. Get rid of it. Whatever that is, throw it away. It's worthless. You know what I had to answer that question with? What tends to be my God? Me. When I'm looking this way, you know what I'm tending to look in? A mirror. At myself. So what do I have to lay down? Me. Because I tend to be my God. I tend to want what I want when I want it. But repent. Change your mind. Turn and look for the one thing that is real and good. Do I earnestly seek to know Jesus more? If the answer is no, then what do you seek more than Jesus? Get rid of it. It's not worth it. If you have a hobby, that's good. If you have a hobby that takes away your affections and your longings for Jesus, get rid of it. Video games on your phone? Worthless little swipings? Instagram? Facebooks? If those things, if you can go on your phone, which you can do, because they all have it, and find out how much time you've spent on Instagram and Facebook, one day, I, looked, I tallied up my time, or I like just looked, looked on the phone and said how much time in uh, social media content. It was over an hour. You know how much time that day I'd spent in the Word of God? Not an hour. Flipping through worthless things. So what do we do? Get rid of it. Oh, well, that's how I, I talk to my friends. You know what? Use your phone. Call them up. Go get coffee. Have a real relationship with people for a change. If, if your focus is here, and this is where all your affections goes, repent. Change your mind. Because all of that stuff is fleeting. And it, you know what that stuff tends to do to us? I'm just going to hit on social media for a second. It tends to make us feel even more worthless. Because we're seeing fabricated lives of people that aren't doing what they're doing. Right? It's, it'd be like me posting a picture of my kids all smiling and happy this week. Not reality. What, dad crushing it, four days without mom, killing it, all the laundry's done, killing it. Nope. Baking cookies, right? Lauren's coming home to a mess, right? So if any of you want to come to my house and clean afterwards, that'd be great. (laughs) Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you long for Jesus as your greatest treasure? Longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure truly transforms how I live everyday life. What I give myself to. What I'm affectionate about. What I desire. What gets my time, effort, energy, money, focus. See, if my longings are after Jesus, then you know what my greatest desire would be for my kids? For them to long after Jesus. Not behavior modification. You know where I tend to err? Trying to get them to behave. But if my longings were desperately and deeply for Jesus, then my focus wouldn't be on trying to get them to behave better. My focus would be on them trying to long for Jesus more. And that would change how I parent, wouldn't it? Longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure transforms how I deal with circumstances. When stuff's hitting the fan, when things are unraveling, when deals are falling apart, I recognize that God is in control and there's not one molecule in the entire universe that's outside of his control. Longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure transforms also how I interact with the world. When your crazy neighbor is mad at you because, you know, some, one of the boxes flew out because of the wind out of your uh, recycling and ran on, went on their lawn, right? And they're yelling and screaming at you. Longing for Jesus as your greatest treasure transforms how you see that person. You don't see him anymore as your enemy. 
You see him as a sinner who needs Jesus. When the family members within your family, the crazy ones, you know what I'm talking about? You may be it, but the crazy ones in your family, right, when they're giving you a hard time and they're hurting you or they're saying stuff behind your back, it transforms how you see them because you recognize that they're in just as much need of a Savior as you are. Longing for Jesus as my greatest treasure transforms how I live life, how I deal with circumstances, how I interact with the world. So will we be the type of people that leave this place and long for Jesus as our greatest treasure? Let's pray. Father, it's so easy for us to sit here for an hour and look at your word and sing praises to your name and worship and pray. But God, I pray we would not be the type of people that would give our affections to you for an hour on a Sunday morning and then forget you throughout the entirety of the week. That we would earnestly seek you every day. That we would long for you as if we were in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Recognizing there is nothing in this world that will satisfy. Nothing in this world that will quench our thirst more than you. So God, I pray that we would not have affections for the things of this world. That we would long for you. And understand that your love is better than life. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you for this place. I thank you for the churches in this area that, that come together to talk about you. I thank you for the churches in this area that proclaim your goodness, your gospel in this community. God, we thank you for Redeemer, which is right next door. We thank you for Crossroads and David Gold. We thank you for Summit Church and the pastor and the staff there. God, we thank you for Riverside. God, I pray that your name would be glorified today across the world and that the church would begin to understand that we are the light of the world and that a light should not be hidden. And so as we leave this place and we scatter throughout the world in our lives, God, I pray that we would show others how great you are, that when people look at our lives, they would say, he or she loves and treasures Jesus. God, for us, for those of us here today that uh, don't believe that that will ever be true of us, I pray that right now you would speak to their heart. God, you are a real God. Your Holy Spirit is living and active and is at work. So God, I pray that your spirit would flood this place right now, that you would shake the walls so that we may know that you are God. And in our stillness and in our singing, in our minds and in our hearts and our souls, God, that you would affirm your love for us and the grace and mercy that you have for us and that, that we would begin to see your power in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory in this place. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray.